Hey guys, welcome back to YouTube. It's been a long time since we've done an official YouTube video. Yeah, I almost forgot we did them. I know, uh, we did four, I think, so far. I've never pub published one. So, here in a second, we're going to do our like our normal podcast intro, stuff like that. We pretty much don't pay any mind to the camera. You guys just get a look into the studio. The turtle's behind me, you may see him swim around. Um, but today we're doing out of Adam Benedict's books, Monsters and Prints and Oddities and Prints. We're just going to do like three to five random stories and kind of discuss what we think about them. I mean, uh, off the cuff. Yeah. So this is the only way you'll get to hear this besides Patreon is on YouTube. Oh, so it's kind okay. of a little bonus thing. So the bonuses we've been doing on YouTube are on Patreon, like our shorter episodes. Yeah. Whatever we'll put on YouTube too to kind of help with that. Okay. So it's not the same content. But it's not the full Patreon episode either. So if you want the full Patreon episode, you have to go and have Patreon. So we're not recording this whole thing. We are. But this is just like an off-the-cuff thing. This isn't our normal Patreon episode. You'll see. Don't worry. Jay doesn't know any of the planning. No, I don't. Like your Giant Trees episode? Yeah. was just a bonus on Patreon. Right. It didn't count as that week's episode. Okay. Bonus episode. Yeah, this, that's pretty much what it is. Bonus. B so we still got to do our bonus. intro on uh, for, for the actual episode. So, have fun, guys. It's good seeing you again. Good night, little pets. All right. All right. Weird. You ready? Are you ready? Hello, hello, and welcome back to Cryptids of the Corn Podcast. I am the great and powerful mystery. And I am the obviously bald Jay. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't. <laughs> well, when I look at the camera, the camera. Uh, man, <laughs> I wasn't prepared. <laughs> All right, so we're today we're using uh, oddities in print and monsters in print by Adam Benedict. So basically, these books are amazing resources for us. Well, actually, you know, they're a multitude of bizarre occurrences, peculiar people, and unexplained events from newspapers of yore. <laughs> so basically, he went through uh, and found a bunch of old monsters and odd things in print from, like, what is the earliest ones? Like, eight, early 1800s oh, yeah. up until, I think, 1924 is as early as he gets. Or most recent? Yeah. Thank you. That's correct. So we're going to do, like, three to five of these. We're going to just kind of, we, we're, we're not pre-planned. We don't know what ones we're going to pick. We're just going to kind of go off of that then. So what's the first one we're picking? You want to do that one? Yeah, go ahead. What Keep in mind, what, read, the, read what newspaper it came from and the year first, because there's some language in this that's very different. Okay, I'm literally just opening this randomly. Okay. So what newspaper so, in the year? This is the Evening World newspaper, uh, April 29th, 1905, New York. The title is Queer Looking Monster Dug Out of Rocks. Long, hairy animals scared workmen after a blast on West Side. So what? Weird looking, what is it? No, queer looking monster dug out of rocks. That's odd. Dug out of rocks. Well, it says after a blast on West Side, so we're about to find out. Maybe yep. they were digging under the city. I don't know. Maybe digging for a building. We'll find out. So here we go. And again, this was 1905. Whether it was a Jabberwock, a Bandersnatch, a Jub Jub Bird, or a snark that emerged from the bowels of the earth in the city today, causing 30 workmen to drop their tools of trade and take to the highest points in sight is a moted question. This is weird language. I know, and the language is always weird when we do these old, old stories. So, um, before I just keep going, like, they, they were talking about Jabberwock, Bandersnatch, back in 1905? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, they were more common, and that's before they went extinct. Interesting. So, like, it, Harry Potter... Stuff like that's what it was from, right? Or how I know it, the Jabberwocks from uh, Alice in Wonderland is the famous one. Ah, okay. But the Bandersnatch was from yeah, the Harry Potter with this other spinoff. The I can't think of some uh, creatures, Fantastic Beasts, and Where to Find Them. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. So that it was something fully as bad as any beast in the late Mister Carroll's menagerie. There can be no doubt. Zoologists are cordially invited to the saloon at 64th Street and Amsterdam Avenue to view it and pass an opinion on genus and habitat. 
What happened was this. 30 workmen, honest Irish sons of toil, with an Italian scattered here and there among them, were busily engaged today in making deeper the hole on 63rd near 11th Avenue, where the foundation for the first of Henry Phillips' model tenements is to be laid. So they're putting up apartment buildings. Yeah, they're putting up apartments. They're beginning a foundation for that. So what... Uh, what state you say this was in? New York. This is in New York. I think New York. New York. City. New York? I think so. Yeah. So I, the bedrock has to be really close to the surface there. I'm gonna guess if they're di- if they're blasting rock. Yeah. To build tenement houses. I would imagine so. You know, here what is our bedrock most of the time? Like 30 feet in Ohio. Uh, I've seen it before. We dug it out one time. Uh, well, I mean, anytime you dig a well or anything like that, you get below the bedrock layer. Yeah, if you dig it right. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think most of ours in Ohio, our it's part deep. of Ohio is 20 or 30 feet. Yeah, it's pretty pretty far down. Uh, but, you know, I've been to areas, I'm trying to think, where was I? We were somewhere where the bedrock was exposed. Hmm, interesting. Uh, I can't remember if it was out west. I, I really can't remember off the top of my head, but I remember like seeing rock sheets. I'm like, oh, that's weird. Like, oh, no, that's a bedrock layer. Yeah. Like, oh. Interesting. Yeah, you don't get that around where we're from. You know, not often. Um, Let's see here. Where was I? Sorry. No, you're good. Um, went out, okay, so wait, where the foundation for the first Henry Phillips mo- model of tenements is to be laid, went out from between the ruins of a giant rock, which had just crumbled from blasting pow- powder, came a queer, hairy animal, as long as a man with legs like those of an orangutan and a head the size of an orange. That's strange. So we have a man-sized creature, hairy. With a tiny head. Yeah. Kind of like... And orangutan yeah. legs. Like the head from uh, that guy in uh, Beetlejuice that's sitting on the couch. You know what yeah, I'm talking about? Yeah, like the shrunken head guy. Yeah. See, I was going to try to make a Dover Demon connection, but that doesn't sound anything like the Dover Demon. No. At not, all. Not at all, with being hairy and whatnot. But the, the thing it does is the short legs and being tall still. The Dover Demon had really short legs, like an orangutan. Mm. But still was, you know, four and a half, five foot tall. Right. Hmm. Yeah, it's not that. Okay, continue. A creature is so ridiculous, ridiculously out of proportion according to modern standards could only be of some prehistoric monster. And however interesting such may be to naturalists, they are not the least bit so to the knights of the pick and the spade. So the workers. Gotcha. Yeah, they definitely wrote sentences different back then. So, yeah, they were basically saying that naturalists would find this creature very fascinating. But not the workers that probably were probably about to get to that martyred this thing. <laughs> I'd say so. <laughs> oh, the little cluster of whiskers in the center of old Terence McManus's throat stood out at a fearful angle when his eyes lighted on the creature. So his hair stood up on end. Right, yeah. <laughs> That's the way to put that. <laughs> then down went Terry's pick into the earth, and up went, went his voice to the heavens in a shriek that fair froze the blood in the veins of his comrades. Okay, here, this is in quotes, so what he said. Howly mither, look at it, look at it, wailed Terry, and of course, everybody took a look. Then there was quick action, and in less than 30 seconds, the monster had the hole to itself. Along the edges, scared, white faces peered over at it. They saw a long, sinuous body and muscular legs, with three fierce talons at the end of each foot. They saw a foolish little head in the center of it, two beady black eyes. They saw a tail that curled at the end and a body full of irregular bumps. Mm. So, almost monkey-like, with a really tiny head, black eyes, which kind of remind me of a gray. Mm Mm-hmm. And but tumors, yeah, bumps all over. And remember, it was so hairy. Huh. Well, maybe the Dover Demon had mange. You're really stretching this one out. Uh, well, it's another cave creature, so it's just like one of our famous cave creatures we haven't done in a while. Right? Yeah. It's just an odd one. This is very strange. We haven't really come across anything like this. No, yet. no, it didn't really match. I mean, maybe um, maybe the ring pen deck. Even that doesn't have the... the no, I'm not saying it's a uh, 100% match, but yeah. I'm just trying to think of the only thing... With three fierce talons. Well, yeah. So, that's the thing, though. Dover Demon, House of Evil Goblins, all have three toes. Mm. 
prehistoric, different oh. inbreeding, inbreeding or different not uh, prehistoric biosphere. Shadow biosphere. Yes. I don't think so because it has hair and it looks. So if it was a shadow biosphere, it'd probably look very different. Gotcha. I just wanted to say that. I know you like your words. <laughs> Go ahead. Leisurely around the hole went the monster, Sorry. then decided to climb out. There was a scattering of citizens at once. Big Pat Coughlin didn't get out of the way in time, and before he knew it, the monster was close to him. Pat didn't wait to learn whether or not to, its intentions were hostile. He swung the spade, which he had clung to, <coughs> around at it and landed on top of its little head. <laughs> There was a crack, and the monster rolled over for the count. <laughs> I bet it did. <laughs> Before he could get up again, some of the others landed on him with rocks, and he gave and he gave up the ghost. So he died. Oh, gotcha. They okay. beat him to death. First, he got hit in the head with the a shovel, spade. Which, you ever seen the shovel girl when she when the, she hits that one girl in the head with a shovel? Mm-hmm. So I don't, know if he, I, well, I don't know if he hit him flat with a shovel, because I hit Lucas Huger flat with a shovel. Or with a blade of the shovel. Ooh, yeah. That's a very different weapon. Oh, yeah. Big time. Uh, one just hurts. Like, one you don't know you got hit by because you're dead. Yeah, I could slice your skull. And then he was beat to death with rocks. rocks. <laughs> Those poor things, like, I've never seen nothing. Like, you go, what him? You just wanted to come over and check him out. Maybe give him a sniff or something. Well, yeah. He's like, man, you guys look cool. Whack. <laughs> <laughs> dead. And then beat to death with the rocks. Sorry, continue. Then he was carried into the saloon, where Big Pat sold him as a curiosity. Big Pat sold him to the saloon. After he busted his face open. The gang taking the price out in mixed ale. So he sold it for beer? Yeah. All right. The only animal expert around, 11th Avenue, gave it as his opinion that the beast was a South American sloth. Hmm. Here, let me finish. There's only one more paragraph left. Yeah, go ahead. And this is what he said in quotes. I was down there once, he said, and seen them hanging to trees by them talons. It's a sloth. That's what it is. No one could explain how a South American sloth could get from his habitat on the Amazon River to an 11th Avenue excavation. But there he was, and he was on, and he is on view for the skeptical. Did they beat a sloth to death? <laughs> I hope not. It's a sloth. A three-toed sloth? The three toes. Yeah, hairy. The tiny head. Hairy. The long neck, the short uh, the short back legs. Hmm. Did they beat a sloth to death? How did the sloth get up there, though? Well, I don't even care about that. Somebody's pet got out. But the sloth crawled out of a hole at him. And they just whacked it over there with a shovel. Like, ah, but but here's, here's the thing. He said it was the size of a man. Yeah. They do not get that big. At least the, modern, the two modern species we have mm-hmm. don't get that big. Well, and I have a cool little fact for you about the two modern species we have. Ooh, and there's there's a, actually more than two, but the two main groups. Let's hear the fact. So the three-toed and two-toed sloths yeah. are not very closely related at all. They're from two different branches of sloths. Different genus? Uh, they may be, actually, yeah. I think they are. So, you know, there's giant sloths and there's marine sloths and all these sloths of the past ice age. Yeah. They both were members of those two different family groups, and they both fit the same niche. And that's why they survived in the modern day times. Ah. Even though they look kind of similar and they live in the same area, yeah. they are not close related at all. Huh, it's like how everything turns to crabs. Like how everything turns to crabs. Everything turns but to so sloth. But so there were many species of sloth that were human sized. That could be in the three. To- so there was literally there was the three toed family of sloth and the two toed family of sloth. Hmm. They had five digits still. It's just the clawed, the clawed toes. So, hmm. so this could be a relic. Is there, is there ever such thing as a cave sloth? Yes, remember we talked about this giant ground sloths. We well, yeah, those. They they specifically only lived in caves underground. Well, they made their own caves. Remember? Well, right. Yeah. But yeah, no, there's dozens of species mm-hmm. that were burrowers. So what if it burrowed all the way from South America to? No, New I York? don't even think that. I think it may have been a relic sloth species from North America. Mm. It could be one of our cave creatures that literally. Uh, so the giant ground sloths and then some of the cave dwelling sloths. We think a lot of their diet was subsidized by um, like eating roots and stuff like that. Like modern day burrowing animals, a lot of times they don't ever go into the surface to eat. Aha, uh-huh, okay. So what if they just cracked open into its cave, and it's just kind of like, huh, what's going on? Whack! <laughs> Dunk. Beer money. <laughs> yeah. What was his name? Big Pat Garrison or something stupid? Big Pat, yeah, Big Pat. Uh, Big Pat. Would 
senior. What was his last name? Big, Big Pat Coughlin. Big Pat Coughlin. Yeah. Big Pat Coughlin seen this poor, like, five-foot-tall sloth, sloth. And just whacked it with a shovel. You know how hard down that sloth probably fell? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, wait. Immediately. They immediately. got belted with stones to death. I mean, even the big sloths weren't fast. Yeah. They were mean, but they weren't fast. Yeah. Oh, man. I really think this may have been a relic sloth species. Interesting. I would have gave you some species name if I, you know, if we did any research for these episodes. Yeah. <laughs> but... I really think it could have been one of these. There was plenty of species that were like human sized. It does fit the the, the uh, description though, mm-hmm. like almost. And then the on. longer tail. So modern day sloths don't have really any tail. They right, do have yeah. a tail. Yeah. It's just hard to see. Uh, but giant ground sloths and some of the landlocked sloths and even some of the marine sloths had pretty uh, significant tails. Uh, giant ground sloths had dragging tails. They literally had them for counterbalance for when they stood up and they were swimming. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So they had this giant weight behind them so they could. Swing, they put so much force behind their forearms. Uh, that's how they counterbalanced it. They didn't have to fall forward or fall on their right. face. Yeah. Because uh, they would swing hard. I mean, there was um, that one pile of sloth dung that's kind of famous because it has a prey animal in it and crushed up saber tooth tiger bones. And their leading theory is that uh, sloths, these giant rat sloths specifically, the, I'm talking about like, a, oh gosh, I'm forgetting the name, uh, not Megaloceros, that's the deer. Megatherium. Megatherium, okay. Uh, would I know that from Ark? Yeah, they would. Uh, they were they're kill stealers, so okay. they would go in and take food from other predators. They were omnivores, so they you know they get a lot of vegetation too. But kind of imagine like a grizzly bear right, coming yeah. up on a wolf kill. Right. You know, I'm so much bigger. Unless there's fifty wolves. Yeah. You know, you're gonna be like, okay, this is mine. So the leading theory is, he came up on a saber toothed cat kill, and saber toothed cats did not want to give it up. So he just killed it. Oh, uh, yeah. So he ate them, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, these were one of humans' greatest monsters, too. Hmm. I mean, I told you about all the ones we found that were burnt to death. Oh, yeah. Well, that's how we killed them all, right? Yeah. We, we, we They were already on the way out. And we just accelerated it. Yeah. Like, oh, you sleep in this nice big cave, and we like this cave. But here, no more oxygen for you. Dead. That's what they do. They'd start fires. They wouldn't even burn them all. They'd start fires at the mouth of the cave and just suck, suck all the oxygen out. And yeah. they'd suffocate and they wouldn't even know it. Um, I know a guy that did that with a, a beehive or a hornet's nest, but he used a Coca-Cola. Hmm. For the CO2 produced? Yeah, he just shook up a can of Coke and then shook it up and then popped it open and shoved the can down into the hole and let it sit. And about five minutes later, all of them were dead. There's another side tangent for you. I know we got really hard on this one. Yeah. Me and Emily were watching Mixology last night. Or, okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a bar competition. Right, yeah. And this guy put dry ice in his drink, and he fused it to the bottom of the glass. And the judges refused to drink his drink because they said even if a sliver of that dry ice pops off and we get it in our throat, we will die. Yeah. And he's like, blah, 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 blah. This is <laughs> something. I'm like, yeah, what were you thinking? It looks cool. Yeah. But if you do it wrongly, we'll die. And they're like, but it, he's like, I'm a professional. I know what I'm doing. Sure. But if you do it wrong, we're going to die. But, uh, and we're not trusting you. In his defense, who's going to take a big gulp out of it? You're just tasting it. But no, no, the whole th- point is to produce a beverage. Because that's the other thing. It's got to be servable. Yeah. It's got to be in a bar. you got to be able to hand this to somebody and walk away. You drink it with a straw. You do not give a patron. No, that doesn't. You don't want to drink it with a straw because then you're, it's affixed to the bottom of the glass. Oh, you're right up against it. Yeah. You just sip. It just was a poor idea. I it was, looked really cool, don't get yeah. me wrong. But imagine you handing that to a bar patron. You, your right. bartender. Gosh, no. Hand that to a bar patron, and you walk away. Not the people at our bar. Exactly. Yeah. you gotta, you got to plan for those people. Yeah, true. You can't, you know, not everybody's going to be a sophisticated drink, you know, a drinker when it comes to these stuff. You need a sophisticated bar setting for that, yeah. for sure. But if you just hand somebody that drink and walk away, they, they may not know dry ice is They're gonna lethal. They're going to die. Yeah, exactly. Like, there's people that, um, it was like, a, I don't know if it was for... What it was for. It's like influencers and stuff. They thought it would be cool for like someone's birthday. They dumped, they ordered a bunch of dry ice and dumped it into their swimming pool. And like, oh yeah. And they all jumped in. Oh gosh. Two of them died. I bet you they did. They couldn't get out. CO2. Yeah. They couldn't breathe. And then they couldn't get out. They couldn't, and they were trying to get out. And then they couldn't see to find their way out of the pool. And two of them drowned in there. So the the lady that went home last night on on me and Emily's new show was, so they're all professional bartenders except one, uh-huh. and she was an Instagram bartender, and she would make really pretty drinks, uh-huh. they always taste horrible, Yeah. she finally went home, it took like three episodes, and we're like, finally, damn, 
But everybody else was making bad mistakes. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, so she, so she, she kept squeaking through. Yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah, a drink has to taste good. So what's your thoughts on this, the giant ground sloth? I think you, that's it. I think I think that's... I love this. I love these books. Adam Bennett did a great job. Yeah. Uh, the Pine Bearings Institute is uh, he's part of that, too. Uh, so he's a really cool dude. Uh, maybe we'll have him on the show one day. I know a couple people that know him. That'd be neat. Um, but these are really good books for these kind of resources, because this yeah. stuff would die if you didn't put it all together. Right, exactly. Probably um, for sure. You want to do, do, do page 100. Oh, I just opened up to a, one that just... What's the title? To me. Upsets Ideas of Scientists. Okay. And this is still, we are still in Monsters in print. Yes, yeah, still in the Monsters in print. And he does have a third book. I don't have it yet, but it's Ghost in print. Ooh, okay. Just so everybody knows, you know, we're giving Adam shout outs. This, is, this one's interesting. Just the title here. So it's Upsets Ideas of Scientists, um, Los Angeles Herald, September 9th, uh, 1906. Man captures a strange animal. Monster swims about in Great Salt Lake, resembles both fish and saurian. So saurian's dinosaur. Okay. So when you say when you hear anybody use the word saurian, they mean dinosaur or dinosaur-like. Gotcha. Imitates the human voice. Ooh, I don't like that. Hmm. Special to the Herald, it says. So that's the, that's the headline of the article. So a saurian fish. It resembles both fish and saurian, and, and imitates the human voice. So, what year is this again? Sorry, 1906? Yep. So, keep in mind, you got to think about what dinosaurs look like to modern or to people of the time in 1906. They were barely standing up reptiles, some of them. Like lizards. Yeah. Like we we're still reconstructing skeletons. Very, well, we're still reconstructing them wrong. We don't know what dinosaurs look like. We still don't know what dinosaurs look like. We, I feel we have a better idea today. Yeah. We have more technology put with how bones work together and stuff like that. Ain't that crazy that we really don't know what they look like? Exactly. But we do have skin samples now and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Do we have any DNA, like no. actual flesh DNA? No. None of it made it? Mm-hmm. Too way, too way, way, way too long. But yeah, there, there's a side tangent already. If we get really lucky in Antarctica, we may find one. There's some crazy stuff in Antarctica. Just like mammoths are frozen in the permafrost. Yeah. Antarctica's been cold since the dinosaurs were on it. Mm-hmm. So there's a chance beyond the ice wall that somewhere under the ice sheet ice wall. there's a dinosaur. But so you gotta keep in mind basically when they say Saurian in nineteen oh six, yeah, they're talking big lizard. Okay. So it's not like what we think about today with feathered raptors and right, giant yeah. sauropods and stuff like that. You're thinking big lizard. Different time period, yeah. different thoughts. I just want to put that out there that you know, over a hundred years ago we thought dinosaurs very differently. All right, so this is, took place in Murray, Utah, September 8th. James Franson of this village recently made one of the most remarkable discoveries of the century, one which will keep the learned men busy for months to come, and explaining what they have always declared was an impossibility, namely that no living thing could exist in the salty waters of the inland sea Great Salt Lake. Until a week ago, Mr. Franson was of the same opinion. As the professors who have written so much about the briny water, waters of the lake, but today you couldn't make him believe that any animal resembling a cross between a monster fish and an alligator does not thrive where nothing else can sustain life. Mr. Franson's discovery came about in this way. While camped on Antelope Island one day last week, Franson, his wife, and two sons were sitting on the shore of the lake. They were looking out across the water towards Salt Lake City. The, f- the father beheld an animal swimming em- lazily on the surface of the lake and not more than 100 feet from shore. Without taking his eyes from the spot, he called to his wife and sons to look where he was pointing. As they did so, the queer-looking object raised itself from the water and set forth a shriek that was the nearest approach to the wail of a human being that could be imagined. As the terrifying sound ceased, the animal dropped back into the water and continued its journey towards the shore. Ooh, that sounds, this sounds weird already. Mm-hmm. Almost instantly, the Pransons were again startled to see several smaller members of the same family swimming 10 or 15 feet behind the Great Salt Lake Monster. Um, and then, so it, now it breaks into a 
capture strange saurian. So let's pause there. All right. Uh, that's odd. So we don't really get what it looks like yet. So it, yeah. it stood up out of the water. The only description it says is a cross between a monster fish and an alligator. That's not really a description, though. I know. That's like, what's fish, what's out? Anyways, it comes up out of the water, screams like a human, and then goes back in and starts swimming with its presumably offspring following behind. Right, yeah. Right. Or ah. just members of... But looked at them, looked at them, screamed, and then continued to swim. So was that a kind of like a don't mess with me thing? Yeah. Because if it did have babies with it, you know, could be kind of protective, saying like, just trying to scare people. Right, yeah. And, you know, a lot of animals will kind of put on that face of like, don't mess with me, you know, especially when there's offspring around. Like a bear? Yeah. Bear, any, I mean, even some reptiles and stuff will, will go out of their way to make sure they're, like, mother crocodiles, you know... When they're babies, when they're they're not like directly protecting their babies, yeah. But where their hatchlings are, they are hyper aggressive in that area. Gotcha. Okay. So. Oh, I was gonna say like bowfin. That bowfin are a whole different level. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, continue. Let's see. Let's see. What is this a big bowfin? <laughs> you would just be uh, over the moon. I have a big bowfin story for you, actually. Oh, well, you want to get to it after this? No, or it's right a whole now? different. It's a whole different episode. Oh, okay. It's in Canada, it's back to both. Gotcha. Okay. So it says now there's a break. It says capture strange saurian. So for a few seconds, the Murrayites, so the people of the town, kept their, or I guess that family kept their eyes on the strange appearing group of animals, or whatever you are pleased to call them. But as the importance of the discovery revealed itself to the elder Franson. He jumped to his feet and set about to effect a capture. In his early days, as everyone hereabouts knows, Mr. Franson was one of the best steer punchers that Montana boasted. What's that mean? That's a cow puncher. Okay. Like, literally punch they cows? They literally punch cows. Oh, nice. And as quick as one of the best steer punchers in Mon- Oh, as quick as a flash, he ran to the tent and returned with a rope some 50 feet in length and prepared to take a try at lassoing the strange animal. By this time, it had approached to within 20 feet of the shore, closely followed by the smaller members of oh, its, its family. Oh, it's heading at them. Yeah. Oh, he didn't get that from the first part. Uh-uh. It sounded like it was like kind of passing in front of him. Yeah, so the, that's by. a whole different mindset. This thing stood up, roared, and now it's coming at you like a beeline with its, with its babies. Yeah, that's not cool. That's a feeding behavior. So let's see what it does. Oh, here. gosh. By this time, it had approached within 20 feet of the shore, closely followed by the smaller members of its family. Circling the rope above his head, Franson made a swift and accurate throw and caught the wriggling monster about two feet below its head. Then, like a flash, he made a half hitch of the other end of the rope around the tree, limb of a tree, and the capture was complete. For fully an hour, the monster wriggled and twisted, straining so hard at times, Franson feared the half-inch rope would be snapped. But slowly, the animal lost its strength and eventually was hauled ashore. By actual measurement, the monster was 33 feet long. Its head resembled that of an alligator, and the tail and body were of slate-colored hue. And it looked more like a man-eating shark than anything else. After securing the, in quotes, fish alligator with other ropes and making sure that it could not escape, Franson got into his launch and made a hasty trip to Saltaire, and then and thence to Salt Lake City, where several well-known men who knew France who would not concoct such a story for the purpose of playing a joke on them, were induced to return with him and transport the monster to Salt Lake. So now it goes on to him taking this to Saltaire, wherever that city is. The, you got any idea right now yet what this could be? Yeah, I do. Care to share? Sounds like a Mosasaur. A Mosasaurian. Oh, okay. Aquatic reptiles. They, right. They're very uh, closely related to monogorgons in modern day modern years. Cause very alligator shaped heads, most of the species we think of for modern day. Mm-hmm. But, you know, much more, I guess, in this time, you're looking at more fish like bodies. The glut, you know, they, uh, we, I think most people kind of get behind that they would have very smooth skin yeah. on their body for air, or not air, aquatic dynamics, like being able to swim the water smoothly. Uh, we now know they had tail flukes. So f- tail fins, like actual fins that look like shark fins. Okay. Um, and flippers. 
So I could definitely see how somebody in 1906 looking at this would be like, well, the front look, the head looks like an alligator, but everything else looks like a big shark. Yeah, uh, yeah, it looked like more like a shark, man eating a shark than anything else. It's yeah. like really kind of screams Mosasaurian. And keep in mind, this is in the Salt Lake. Nothing lives here besides some brine shrimp and stuff like that. Mm. So there's no fish. There's no prey animals. There's no, you know, this is not salt as in ocean salt. This is toxic levels. Like, yeah, super high. Yeah. Like Black Sea mm -hmm. almost. Dead Sea. Dead Sea, yeah, that's what it is. Close enough. <laughs> they are close to each other. Right, that's, yeah. <laughs> One has nothing in it. Dead Sea. Okay, so taken to Saltaire. The trip was naturally a dangerous one. With the instant that the monster recovered its strength, it had lashed the water into a white foam and more than once succeeded in taking the launch a mile or a mile or out of its course. Oh, am I not talking in the mic? Yeah. All right, there we go. A huge tank was secured at Saltaire, and eventually the strange monster was landed in the Salt Palace, where a special aquarium was erected for its home. The palace has been crowded with visitors every day since the doors were thrown open to the public. More than 10,000 people, having already paid 25 cents each to behold the only animal of its kind ever captured, and so far as known, the only one with the exception of the other members of the same family, which promptly disappeared when France and lassoed the mother that had ever been seen. As the waters of Salt Lake are more than one-third salt, it seems impossible that anything could live in it. But the evidence furnished by Mr. Franson is indisputable. Were you going to say something? Mm -hmm. Okay. I thought, yeah, I heard, like, I thought. I don't know. I do have some, but yeah, continue. What seems all the more remarkable concerning the monster is that it comes nearer imitation, the human voice, than a parrot. Many who have watched the gigantic fish alligator declare that it all but talks. And the attendant, whoever leaves the salt palace, goes further and declares it does talk. And then he says, in quote, I don't care how much fun you make of me, he said the other day. That thing can talk as plainly as a man can, for I have heard it say things when there was no one but myself anywhere near the building. That's horrible. Why, just last night, shortly after the doors had been locked and I was preparing to go to bed, that great whale of a fish raised its head out of the water and said, Say, Bill, what has become of my old friend Brigham Young? I heard indirectly that he was dead. Oh, that's weird. That's weird. That's what the fish thing said. The attendant also declares that the monster can sing, and he would not be much surprised if some enterprising theatrical manager tried to secure it as an attraction. The attendant has figured out that the blame thing could even be taught to play a piano. There seemingly being no limit to its powers of imitating the human voice and doing what it sees or hears humans being doing, human beings doing. Scientists from Brigham Junction declare that the monster is 44,000 years old at least and possibly older. How the heck did they determine that? I don't know how they got that part out of it. But Do you know who Brigham Young was? Well, that's what BYU is named after. Yeah. Um, he was he was Mormon, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, so there's a lot with Brigham Young. So that's kind of weird. The, the, the talking monster, <clears throat> mentioned Brigham Young and said it was his old friend. I don't think it was his old friend. I have a whole different idea of this. Continue. Sorry. No, that's it. That's the end of it. So yeah, uh, he was in between uh, Joseph Smith and John Taylor. Okay. So at the more, you know, the Church of Mormon. Like the founder was just... Yeah, right. so he was in between, and then the one that kind of ran into the ground. Mm, okay. So he's in between those two. Uh, I think he was the one, and I'm talking completely out of my butt now. I think he was the one that was incredibly violent. Oh, okay. Uh, an iron fist kind of guy. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes you have to be the... So to rule. you have this thing that would, in front of thousands of guests, mimic human speech... But would only talk when it was just a couple people. Mm. Babies immediately disappeared after it was caught. Yeah. It was in a lake with no food. It kind of looked like a mosasaur. But it could talk, and it was torturing this one guy. But this one guy could have had schizophrenia. Could. 
I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. This is weird. I love these books. Um, I wonder if... I would like to know if there's any, like, documentation or pictures of this thing, if they really had it in a aquarium or something. 1906? Something would have... Yeah, the cameras existed then. Yeah, but they were uh, still photography. Still? There uh, should be something. You're talking about a moving creature there should be in a tank. There should be something with people standing in front of it. I don't know if you'd have anything. A picture of the tank. How about that? Yeah, that's... There should be something with a plaque that existed that describe what it is. Something should exist. I want to Smithsonian uh, put all that stuff on display. Yeah, and a hole in the ground. <laughs> the whole city's gone. <laughs> oh, they leveled it. Saltaire. How did they think? Did they say 44,000 years old? Yeah. At least. Is this a demon? That's more what I was thinking of. It's talking. Yeah, I think this is a demon. A reptilian? Oh, that's good. I mean, Utah, Nevada, they have a history of underground reptilians. Shrieking. What? Well, talking like a human. Yeah. Ooh. Is this a reptilian or is this a demon? What's the difference? A lot. Is there? Uh, maybe. I don't know. No, I'm kind of getting more demon vibes off this thing. Yeah. What well, can you lasso a demon? I think so. <laughs> Barely. I think you can. Yeah, I, mean, I uh, uh, this guy did. Yeah. I don't think... I, it was kind of weird that it was coming straight for him, too. Demon behavior. I don't know. This is odd. I love these old stories. Demon babies? Portal babies. Where'd they go? In the portal. Under Salt Lake. Where'd all the salt come from? The old ocean that was there. Mmm. Demon salt. No, remember, demons don't like salt. Oh, then it can't be a demon. Oh. Uh, a lot of odd stuff. Yeah. This is a lot of stuff to think about. I don't know. This is a weird story. I mean, nothing wants to be there. Reptilian. I think it's a reptilian. Oh, they don't want to be there either. I mean, they probably weren't. Reptiles, well, whatever it was, wasn't breathing in the in them gills, obviously. No, I mean, you don't want to be in this water. Right, exactly. So, something skin that can handle it. Reptile skin, I don't know. But do they keep it in a tank full of the salt water? They made their own salt water that wasn't as potent, maybe. I don't know. I hope they put it in fresh water. See, there's a lot of holes in this story. Well, I don't know. I wouldn't call them holes. I would just say a lack of information. Missing pieces. Yeah. Same difference. Newspaper article, you know. Right, yeah. This is one page. I don't know what this would be. I have no idea. So I'll start talking and being demonic. I was thinking Moses or Yeah, and singing and possibly potentially now, playing singing, the piano. So... <laughs> The piano thing, I don't know. I think that's maybe a color journalism. Gotcha, okay. Artistic license. Yeah. Now, the singing, I could definitely see. Think about how many animals we have that talk and sing, or not talk, that have communication that sounds like singing to us. Yeah. I mean, birds and some, you know, whatever you want to go with. There's all kinds of animals that communicate that sound like singing to us. It's not. I mean, whales sing. sing. Yeah, even though it's not singing. Right. So it could be singing like that, looking for its offspring or anything. Oh, yeah, its babies are gone. And a lot of animals mimic, so who's to say it wasn't actually talking and mimicking? What happened? You ever seen friend? the talking seal? I think it's Harold the talking seal. I don't think so. Y you want to? There's everybody at home. Look this up. Harold the talking I, seal. Just look up talking seal. I can't okay. remember if his name's Harold or not. I think it's Harold or Howard or something like that. Now this guy taught the seal how to talk. Interesting. And now it sounds like a person talking. You know, I've not seen that. And it's freaky. It's something you'd expect of a better than a parrot. It's like, how are you doing today, Howard? Good, Jim. Oh, and it's like, weird. what did that seal just <laughs> say? Weird. And it's like, and he's like, what do you want, fish? Huh? And it's like, kill it. <laughs> yeah. Where's my club? No, it talks. It does talk. Interesting. Um, when did Brigham Young die? Uh, he was born in eighteen oh one. Nineteen oh one. Eighteen oh one. So whatever this thing was. Let's say it is Im imitating. You know what I mean. I mean, yeah. let's just say let's just say it is. Let's, it's it said what what has become of my old friend Brigham Young. So keep in mind, Brigham Young, you're in Salt Lake City. Well, I heard indirectly that he was dead. So someone, if he's imitating, someone had to have said that. Yeah, but LDS, like headquarters, is right around the corner. Yeah, the number one place of Mormons in the country. No, right, right. I get that, but this is. 
1906. So, I mean, I guess it's possible. It's in that time frame. You know, right. how? I, but I don't know when he died. 1877. So, about 30 years after that. Okay, that's quite the stretch, but it could be. Could be. Oh, wait, no. He may, uh, one second. Yeah, 1877. Okay. Uh, he was born in 1801. Right, yeah, so he's 76, or roughly. He had a big beard. So, yeah, maybe... maybe it says here he had a fight with a lizard once. Oh. Oh, but this is it. This is the lizard. You made that up. I did. A fight with a lizard. How funny would that be? We're just like, no, I'm just like, you know, not a screed or something like that. I got in a fight with a big lizard once. Yeah. I, he had old boxing gloves, like, picture. Of that it. was a piano competition. <laughs> yeah, that was the fight. It was a dueling match. Oh, my gosh. The great Brigham Young dueling oh, piano. Gosh. All right. Pick a short one out of this one, and then we'll move on to the next book. Okay. Submarine Monster. The Florida Agriculturalist Newspaper, November 5th, 1884. 1884. 84. Did we have submarines this time? I know it means submarine as in in the water. Yeah, sub, slap, or dash, dash marine. marine. But I'm just thinking, uh, our first submarine, I think, was called the Monitor. And it was not a, like, not a modern day submarine. You know, it still had a piece of bow at all times. Okay. But I'm just trying to think. I think that was the Civil War when we had submarines. So this had been... Uh, what did you say, 1884? Yes. So what? Uh, when was the Civil War? 1860s? 1870s? You're really testing my... Something like that. I'm not a history buff. Me either. Uh, so was, yeah, so this is after. So I think we've had actual submarines this time. Okay. Um, the title is Strange Fish or Reptile Caught in the Mississippi River. And yeah. they really get the problems of telling if it's a fish or a reptile. Especially back then. Yeah. Which I guess, you know, not everybody's a naturalist. True. It's not like... It. Everyone does that for their job, or did that for their job. All right. A strange marine monster was brought to this city yesterday, says the National American, and will be put on exhibition this week in a building near the square. Bill Orley and Nick Moley. <laughs> Orley and Moley. Uh, yeah. Orley and Moley. Holy moly. Or, Orley Moley. <laughs> Two old fishermen caught it in the river just above the waterworks a few days ago. And since that time, it has been fastened securely to the riverbank. By st- they caught this thing and just tied it to the riverbank? Yeah, by stakes driven around its body. Oh my gosh, this poor thing. In addition to which it is hog-chained by the tail to the bank. When, it, when seen in this position yesterday, it appeared to be about the size of a Newfoundland dog. It had webbed feet that were attached to its body by legs without joints. Its body and back, except the stomach, were covered with large, diamond-shaped, bony scales. Ooh. The long, coarse, yellow hair growing out of these scales and the skin, which bulges out and welts between the scales, hangs together like that on an angora goat. Huh. And is coarse and tough as coconut skin fibers. But its mouth is well worth a detailed description. It is certainly the most hideous opening that has developed in the con- countenance of any animal extant, extant, or extent. Just keep breathing. Or told by about by scientists. So it's the weirdest mouth anybody's ever described. Is what you're saying? Yeah. Mm. Well, the weirdest. No wait. The weirdest. The most hideous opening. Mouth. I know it did sound the worst. It's about the size. Of that of a large alligator, but shaped like a shovel-nosed shark, being very blunt at the end. And the teeth, there are no less than three rows of them in both upper and lower part of its mouth. The teeth are all jagged, the upper rows fitting into the lower rows, and the jaws working laterally, so as to make the teeth grind to powder everything that falls into them. Hmm. So lateral movement is really rare in nature. You gotta think about us Back with our forth. chewing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's really. You wanna do that to the camera so they see what you're doing? There we go. It's really odd. Let's continue. <laughs> Sorry. It just I'm making odd the oddities. With three rows of teeth, that all enter a fit. I mean, odd. You know, three rows of teeth. What's whatever. Yeah, but still, I mean, two rows I've seen are common in nature. Three's pretty 
rare, I would say. Some, some shark have hundreds. Oh, rose? Mm-hmm. Oh, never mind then. Okay. The reptile devilfish, or whatever it is, crawls sideways like a crab, and its eyes are placed one above the other in the top of the skull and bulge out like pegs on a hat rack. I don't know what this is. This. There are no lids to the eyes so that the animal cannot wink, but it pops its eyes in and out of the sockets so fast when the monster is angry that the noise made by this working out of the eyes is similar to the sound made by a cow's feet when the animal is wading in soft, deep mud. Yeah. Right, yeah. That's what I imagined. How did I go again? <laughs> Imagine eyeballs doing that. It's so dumb. <laughs> the tail is shaped like that of a beaver's and is covered with warts of various sizes. The smallest being about the size of a dime and the largest being about the size of a half dollar. Each one of these warts seems to possess the power of moving separately from the other. Uh-huh. And when the whole mass gets to working, it is something frightful to behold. I know what this creature is. It has rather more the appearance of a swarm of bees hanging from the limb of the tree than anything else. and is altogether the most sickening sight imaginable. Do you know what it is? Are you Googling it? All right, you Google monkey breathing. The whole animal is covered with a thick green slime, which seems to ooze out of its body, and especially its tail where it seems to originate from the center of small mouths or openings, one of which is the center of, of each of these warts mentioned. When prodded with a stick, the animal snaps its eyes, grinds its teeth, and each particular hair stands up on end, and every inch of its body seems to writhe and squirm and jerk on its own account and in the manner and direction that seems to give it most comfort. The tongue is forked and black, and darts in and out like that of a sea serpent. It's still, it's still what you think it is? I'm trying to find the exact species. Of what... All right. Oh, oh. I might know what it is. I'll let you go first when we're done. Okay. Oh, I think I know what it is. Okay. The two rivermen who captured it have followed this means of making a livelihood for many years. It seems that the existence of this animal has been known to them and a number of old rivermen in this city for a number of years. They say it has made its abode under the high bank on the left-hand side as you go up the river, and place suitable for such a terrible, uncanny-looking thing to live without much hesitation. They have been much annoyed by this reptile, and have been put to a great deal of experience by repairing their lines, as fish hooks seem to only whet its appetite. As if by instinct, it knew when and where the lines were were set and would go to devour the bait and destroy the lines, which it did almost every night. But lately, a new method was resorted to for dealing with its monster, with this monster, which resulted in its capture, to the great delight as well as astonishment of both the fishermen. Uh, instead of resorting to the old method of fishing, they produced a long, heavy clothes wire and stretched it midway across the river. It was attached at the end of a 10-gallon keg that acted as a buoy. To anchor it down, an old iron cog wheel was used. About 60 feet from the shore, the bait was set in a large steel trap and let down. It was not long before it was gobbled up as fisherman, as a fisherman who was looking after his other lines discovered. The keg was seen bobbing up and down and suddenly disappeared altogether. They commenced to haul on their line and came very near upsetting their skiff. The reptile by this time was furious and lashed the waters into a white foam. It was found impossible to land with land it with the boat, and it took two hours to pull the beast out on the dry land. The old fish net was promptly thrown over it and secured by driving stakes around the outside. The monster bit and snapped and struggled all night to free itself. Until finally, when it was exhausted, five men brought it across the river in a flatboat and left it at an old sawmill just below the waterworks, where his satanic majesty now reposes. There, was a, there the reptile has since been viewed by the curious hundreds of people who have been going there to see the brute. Was it an anglerfish? No. Okay. Oh, yeah, it couldn't have survived on the bank for days. Oh, yeah, you're right. 
So Dumb. I have two options. It wasn't for the hair. What if that was a fungus? So that's one thing that it could have been not doing very hot. Yeah. This is an alligator gar. Ah, uh, that's what I thought. Of. Diamond-shaped scales, yeah. skin pressing out. So I've seen an alligator gar that get really fat, mm -hmm. and they actually have like kind of skin poking out in between the scales, especially on their face. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, not on their body. Their body pretty much always is interlocking. I've never seen one. I've, I guess I've never seen one that overweight. You know, well, it, it just said it was on the tail, though, the warts and stuff. No, I'm talking about it said in between its diamond scales. Oh, it had skin the hairs. Was poking out. Okay, with, yeah. With the hair on it. Yeah. So, yeah, you could have some kind of fungus. I've never, I've never experienced a fish fungus. It's that pronounced, that rough and coarse. Yeah, uh, and it could have been some other things too. It could, uh, it could have even been, uh, let's say it was going into brackish water. It could have been some kind of barnacle and stuff like that. Ah, okay. Uh, and that's really stretching it, but that is another option. Now, how about a really, really far out option? Let's it's hear the it. big beaver-like tail, the plates. All these fins and arms and body things that move independently. The odd head. The odd mouth. Oh. Go ahead. Cyanophore? Nope. Okay. Got a good guess, though. Keep in mind that they're, they're mostly jelly. So, we're... Amlicara is a big family group of Cambrian creatures. So, the Cambrian uh, time frame was really long ago. Uh, I got yelled at for talking about millions and billions of years, so I'm not going to use that. I'm just going to say a really long time ago. Millions and billions. And this is when first the first set of jaws was ever developed. Okay, so that's a long time ago. Yeah. But so is this older than the trees? <laughs> yes, it's older than the mountains. Oh, huh. blowing like the breeze. Yeah. So here's what they look like. This is just kind of a snapshot of the family. They have tons of diversity. Yeah. And I'll give them a lot more time to evolve and adapt. But so. They have the many body segments. They're all independent. Each one of these fins could be independent. Really, really word mouth. The eyes on stalks that could pop in and out. Ah. They had that too. Ah. And then the hairs. So Amlicar was famous for having hairs all over their body. Some of them only had them on the back or the front. Some of them had them down their whole body. You might have. You might have. You might have. Amlicar. So everybody at home, look them up. Amlicar during the. Uh, Amlicar? Yeah. Okay. During the, uh, oh my gosh, I just forgot the name of this. What event, or what time frame? I just Cambrian. Said the Cambrian explosion. Yeah. Oh, that's way early. <laughs> that was when we had our highest concentration of CO2 supposedly in our atmosphere as well. And oxygen. And oxygen. Mm -hmm. That was right when life actually got rolling. Yeah, an explosion of life. So is CO2 good? Bad? Good. Maybe good. It, it depends on what life forms you want to be it's good. present. It's good. Not for us. Life explodes. Says your fake science. Says me. It's fake science. Mm -mm. Yes. Uh, it's Stick just, to it's, biology. It's bad for us. That is biology. No, that's atmosphere. That's earth. Like we breathe in. Hey, anyway. Yeah, we breathe air. We need more oxygen. I don't think that. I don't think the carbon was the issue. Either way, it was the oxygen amount. Maybe it. Expl maybe it gave. Anyways, back to life. To food to life. life. So you could have a couple different things happening. Uh, we talk about time slips all the time. Mm -hmm. So you could have an Amlicara that was just out of time. Yeah. And you just have one that ended up in a river in Florida. Which oh. Florida's no no uh no stranger to strange river animals. Yeah. I mean our good friend Pinky. Right, exactly, yeah. Um What if though it something just survived that long? And that was the other option. It's it'd be really weird for it to be fresh water. But I mean what if it it somehow because ended up in that river system. And there's the, uh, the Vietnamese water centipede, I think it was what it was, there's, which they are probably another Amalakara. They yeah. almost fit the description of Amalakara to the T. Hmm. And they've been seen off the coast of Vietnam and stuff like that constantly for the last decade. Yeah. Or not decade. Century. Sorry. Gotcha. Uh, so, who's to say that it's not, they're just hiding out. And once again, same thing with Pinky. The locals knew about this thing. They knew yeah. about it for a while. Oh, yeah, they knew right where it was yeah. hanging out. They knew where it's home. They knew where, where it was eaten. What if it, like, wound up there and just, you know, and survived? And that could like, be. And stay there, and then it's all inbred and gross. I don't think, I, they just, they would look odd. Yeah. So I think they're just having trouble. So they have all kinds of these little muscle groupings. Mm -hmm. So they can move their hairs and stuff like that, or for sensory organs. But not hairs, like, they're sensory organs. Right. Like a yeah. whisker, like a cat's whiskers. Like a, uh, a, a, what's the thing called? We talked about it with the Stanley Gaster. It has coming out of its 
face. Uh, those are tendrils. Tendrils, yeah. Barbels. Yeah, barbels. Yeah, so the, that's on... Barbels. This would be, they, they would almost be like hair, but it's more like the hair that crustacean have. It's not like hair hair. Gotcha. That's not, a, that's not what it is. It's a different fiber. Gotcha. Uh, so it's really odd. That's a cool one. That was a good one, yeah. I like that one. And I actually think we filled up a whole episode with just Monsters and Prince, so next time we'll do three out of Oddities, Oddities and Prince. Yes. So what's so, your favorite one of these three? That last one was pretty interesting. I, they were all great. The actually, de- you know what? The my demon favorite, lizard that was playing the piano? No, my favorite one was the sloth, because I just imagine <laughs> Big Pat hitting him with the shovel. Big Pat! We need a, we need a Big Pat's shovel, like, swinging the shirt. I don't know. Maybe that'll be the first Patreon t-shirt for the $10 tier. Yeah. We swing my big shovel at this sloth's head. Thunk! It just seems like a funny cartoon. Just like, ugh! Just dead. <laughs> and people belting it with rocks. Oh gosh, and you gotta imagine that. They were probably, they were probably big rocks. Oh yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Poor sloth. Alright, anything else to add? These are great. Yeah, those are... This great books. Oh yeah. Buy Adam's book. Yes. Everybody knows Adam. If you know Adam, buy these. Or uh, even if you don't know Adam, buy them. B- buy but these. Tell them to hit us up. We'd love to have them on. Yeah. Tell them that you bought it because of us. Yes, please. Buy this book. They're not that much either. I think the big one was 22 and the little one was 20. Oh, that's not bad at all. And they, they, I mean, hundreds of stories. Full of Hundreds of articles. Yeah. All right. I have been the great and powerful mystery. And I've been the bald J. And <laughs> made me laugh again. <laughs> uh, remember, uh, check us out on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, if you're hearing this, you're probably either on Patreon or on YouTube. So check out either one. You so know, on YouTube. Yep. If you're on YouTube, check out Patreon, please. Yeah. If you're on Patreon, check out YouTube. We're going to try to do some YouTube independent stuff as well soon. Um, so smash that like button, share that like button, and. Uh, <laughs> Have a good day. Have a good day. There we go. Bye. 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 All right. Goodbye, YouTube. Have a good day. Oh, okay. I was still recording that. Mm-hmm.